Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this class, for this time of study, for the word that thou has presented to us, that we may become more Christ-like, and we may be of a benefit not only to the Lord our Savior, but to others around about us and to ourselves. So we're grateful for the, the words that have been left for us, for the time that we engage in study and the benefit that we derive from it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to start uh, with uh, Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse one. I think that's where I left off. I uh, <clears throat> sort of forgot where I left off, but we'll start start there. It says when we get to you know seven and eight, we're getting in uh, much more uh, well deeper study of the, the things that uh, the writer would have us know. I'm assuming the writer's Paul. Said for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and uh, blessed him. Now we might uh, be well to kind of go back where Melchizedek was mentioned in the historical record, and that's found in Genesis the 14th chapter, verses 17 through. 20. And keep in mind, this was before the mosaical system had been established. So that at this point in time, there's no Levitical priesthood. The uh, head of the family, you know, acted as the priest. But it starts in, in uh, 17, and the king Sodom went out to meet him. And this is talking about Melchizedek, and meet Abraham, or Abram at the time, at the valley of Shave, that is uh, the king's valley. After his return from the uh, defeat of Chedor or, or, or Lamor, where you, you can look it up, and the kings who were with him, Abram and uh, Melchizedek. And uh, in 18, the Melchizedek, king of Salem, he, remember he's king of Salem, king of peace, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest in Hebrew, Kohen. I think I mentioned that last time. Uh, Kohen of God, Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, the God of Most High. And, you know, we go down to uh, verse 7. We'll just uh, mention that now beyond all contradiction. The lesser is blessed by the better. So the superior blesses the in inferior. So, blessed be Abraham of God most high, Melchizedek is superior to Abraham by this fact. Uh, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed uh, be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. Uh, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. Now, I think the question I asked last time is, is, you know, Melchizedek blessed both Abram and God. And we said in verse, you know, on the basis of verse 7 that the uh, uh, lesser is blessed by the better. So that does that mean that Melchizedek is also superior to God? And, you know, anytime you have a, uh, an interpretation that is uh, obviously in error, then your interpretation is wrong. The way they look at it is wrong. And it's certainly not the case that Melchizedek is superior to God. So these two blessings must be different. Well, one uh, blessing of Abraham was for the benefit of Abram, Abram, but not so with the other blessing. The other blessing is just a, an act of adoration of God, and then we do that ourselves. So one's a benefit, Abram, the other is the blessing, the other blessing is an act of adoration. Now this uh, was prophesied, all this was prophesied, we've gone over many times Psalm 110, and we'll just 
uh, go over it very briefly. The first verse says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So if we know from that that he's referring to Christ. This is a messianic uh, psalm. And it goes down in verse 4, uh, speaking of Christ, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So it says uh, in verse 2 of chapter 7, again, talking about Melchizedek, to whom also Abraham gave, Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first translated king of righteousness. Uh, that, that's the tenor, if you will, of his kingdom. It's one of righteousness. Then also king of uh, Salem, that's his territory, which is peace. And it, it says meaning king of peace. And peace and uh, righteousness uh, go together. In Romans the uh, 14th chapter, verse 17, we read that the uh, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy and, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in talking about uh, Melchizedek in verse 3 of chapter 7, it, it says that um, this Melchizedek is without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of day, end of life is eternal. Well, the description gives the impression that he's eternal, but made like the Son of God. Now, he's a type of Jesus as a priest and king. Uh, in that regard, they're alike. One's the type and the other is the antitype. And it says uh, he remains a priest continually. As a type, he remains a priest continually. Uh, Melchizedek is a priest forever. And as an antitype, Christ is a priest forever. Now, the question is about Melchizedek. Was he some spiritual being, a real person? I would say that, given the context, he's a real person. But nothing is mentioned about his uh, birth, his death, anything about his genealogy. Nothing's mentioned. So it is as if he was eternal. His kingship and priesthood never ending because it's never mentioned. And the word uh, continually, I should uh, say, is, uh, and also the word forever, is limited to the period to which it is applicable, whether it's short or long or forever. You have to uh, determine that from the context. So uh, it remains a priest continually because it's just never mentioned that it ever ended. And in that regard, he is a, a type of Christ. And verse four says, now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham, and, and keep in mind that all the Jews uh, consider Abraham as the father of the faith. They always said they were children of Abraham. So he was held in extremely high regard uh, by the Jews. It says, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Now, now spoils is anytime you have a military campaign, you take all the uh, stuff from the enemy. That's the good stuff. The spoils are the good stuff. Top of the heat, best. Uh, by, you know, making the uh, a tenth of the spoil, given a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek. By virtue of that, Abraham is showing the superiority of Melchizedek. And keep in mind that Jesus is superior to the uh, Levitical priesthood. So, and that's the message that the writer is trying to get across the Hebrew uh, Christian. That uh, 
uh, Jesus is superior, and these are these one you're trying to abandon. In verse five, it says, "Indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, you know, all the priests had to come from a family of Levi, uh, you know, the direct lineage of descendants of Levi. Nobody else, and of course, that was abused." when it came to the northern kingdom, when they split, but nevertheless, that's the law. Uh, indeed, those who are of the son of Levi who receive the priesthood, and they receive it by inheritance. Uh, priests came from the sons of Aaron, and particularly the uh, Levi, the son of Aaron, a uh, son of, uh, of uh, Isaac. Uh, Jacob said, anyway, they have a commandment to receive tithes from the people. That was the law that the uh, Levi, Levites were to receive a tithe from the people. And that was their pay, so to speak. Receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren. Though they have come from the loins of Abraham. So the writer here draws a, a distinction between the, the Levitical priesthood and that of Melchizedek. Abraham voluntarily gave tithes to Melchizedek, who was not one of his brethren. Uh, Levites, on the other hand, received tithes by law from their brethren. So there's a difference. In essence, the Melchizedek spirit to Levite and Christ's spirit to Melchizedek. He's after that order. In verse uh, six, he says, But he whose genealogy is talking about uh, Melchizedek, he whose genealogy is not derived from them. Uh, Melchizedek was not a Hebrew. Therefore, he couldn't be a Levite. Therefore, under the uh, um, mosaical system, he could not be a priest. Sounds similar to, to Jesus, but anyway, he received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. You know, keep in mind that uh, uh, God had blessed Abraham and told him not only was he going to have a, a, a lot of offspring, but he was going to be the, the father of uh, of the uh, Jesus, you know, the ancestor of Jesus. In verse uh, seven, now be all be all all contradiction. The lesser is blessed by the better. That's just an axiom. You know, we we all recognize that the uh, the better receives uh, more uh, accolades. Than the, the lesser. That's just the way it is. So Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And we see that in Genesis, the 27th chapter, in verses 27 through 29, we're not going to go there, but Isaac blessed Jacob rather than Esau. You know how that worked. So that uh, meant that uh, Jacob was, even though Esau was the firstborn in Jacob was going to be the greater, the better. In Luke, the 24th chapter, verses uh, 50, 51, Jesus blessed uh, the disciples. He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. So the lesser is blessed by the better. So Jesus was superior to his apostles. It says, and now he came to pass while he blessed them that he was Part of them carried up into heaven. In verse 8, uh, here mortal men, and, and King James and ASB say men that die, they're mortal. So here mortal men receive tithes, but there he, he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives, that is, no beginning, no ending. So, in a sense, Melchizedek, the, the type, lives in Christ, the antitype. In verse 9, uh, 
uh, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes to Abraham, so to speak, in a manner of speaking, because Levi, uh, he was the uh, descendant of Abraham. Of course, he, at this time, he was not even born at way down the line. But anyway, uh, but he was descended from Abraham, so, so to speak. Levi, the, the father of all the priests, received a paid tithes to Abraham. You know, the, and this is also true, isn't it? the lesser paid tithes to the better. So Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Levi did not pay tithes to Melchizedek because he wasn't living at the time, but he did so representatively. Abraham was the head and the representative of Levi. And uh, all, as I said, all the Jews looked to Abraham as the father of the faith. And it says in verse 10, for he, talking about uh, Levi, was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So it's a representative type of uh, tithing that uh, Levi did. So that just means that Melchizedek was greater than Levi and greater than all the uh, priests of the Mosaical system. And but since Jesus was a type of Melchizedek, he he is greater than the priests of the Mosaical system. In verse eleven, it uh, is designed to show the imperfection of the Levitical priesthood. Therefore, if perfection was uh, were through the Levitical priesthood, uh, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron, that is, uh, the Le for, through Levi? <clears throat> well, redemption of mankind could not be achieved through the Levitical priesthood. It was just impossible. That was a, a false of the Mosaical system. And if the Hebrew Christians, if they rejected God's plan of uh, justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, they went about to establish their own righteousness by the works of the law, which could not uh, uh, Achieve their redemption. The works of the law couldn't achieve their redemption. In Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 3, we read that for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And this is what the, what the Hebrew Christians were about to, to do. They were, uh, in essence, substituting the righteousness of the Mosaical system for the righteousness of Christ, a type of uh, a Melchizedekian priesthood. Uh, it said that the priesthood was, uh, in a sense, the basis of the Mosaical economy. The Levitical priesthood was the basis of the Mosaical uh, economy. So no priesthood. No law. I mean, it's, it was part of the laws. So if they didn't have a priesthood, a Levitical priesthood, there's no law. If Levitical priesthood falls, then the old law, the Mosaical system falls. So you can kind of see where this is going. And, it, and you know, we're seeing it now how it's going, but uh, the uh, this was being read by actual people that uh, were considering giving up the Christian system and going back under the Mosaic system. So uh, they were understanding, uh, I think they were understanding this. They shouldn't, it's laid out very clearly for them to understand. But uh, in verse 12, it says, for the priesthood being changed, that's the Levitical priesthood, for it being changed, of necessity, there's also a change of the law. 
Now, you know, you just look at the, uh, the various permutations of this, you could have a change of the law that retained the Mosaical uh, priesthood. So you could have a new law with the same priesthood, but you can't do away the priesthood and have the same law. And the priesthood, the biblical priesthood is being done away with. So you can't have the same law. And that's what the, you know, he'll be getting at. Verse 13, he says, for he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus belongs to another, another tribe. And by law, only priests could come from the tribe of Levi. And the Christ was from the tribe of Judah. So, you know, the Hebrew Christians would understand this. Uh, and this is what the, the writer is making clear. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. They couldn't officiate that, the altar without uh, engaging in sin. Since uh, Christ is now our high priest, you know, just uh, of necessity, the old system is done away with. You can't have him of uh, the tribe of Judah being a high priest and having the old uh, mosaical economy still in place. There had to be a new one. In verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And if you go back and look at the uh, genealogy of Christ, it, it proves that he was from the tribe of Judah, and, and one from the tribe of Judah could not serve as a priest in the political system. In the 15th uh, verse, it says, and it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, one who is not from the Levitical uh, tribe of, of priests. So, of necessity, there's going to be a more perfect covenant to replace the imperfect covenant. <laughs> In verse 16, he, uh, there arises another priest who has come. That, that's Christ. Verse 16, that's Christ. Not according to the law of a fleshly commandment in, in the uh, Levitical priesthood, since it was by lineal uh, descendants. You know, that's a fleshly descent. So not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, the Levitical uh, priesthood, as I said, was according to a, a lineal descent by law. But according to the power of an endless life and it's uh, that's why it's of the same order as uh, Melchizedek because Melchizedek since nothing is mentioned of his ancestors or his lineal descendants or his death or anything else other than what we read just a moment ago it's almost as he has an endless life and, and by uh, uh, a so Example. So, Ken, so Ken, when it when the writer talks about no mother, no father. Wait, 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 wait. we're recording this. Remember, uh, why don't you ask me the, any questions after we uh, finish recording? Then we can we can do that. In verse. Um, See, there's certain things that are mentioned here. There's mentioned in this verse 16, it's mentioned the law and uh, power. So law refers to uh, an outward or a perishable form. Um, but God, I mean, uh, Christ dwelt in the uh, fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. And it talks about uh, 
the uh, fleshly commandment. Well, well, you know, the Levitical priesthood was fleshly in that, you know, it's people, they died. They couldn't continue forever. But Christ is an endless. So there's <clears throat> talking about the perishable and the imperishable. And he also mentions the uh, commandment and uh, fleshly commandment and endless life. Again, the commandment was uh, an outwardly manifestation of uh, a uh, well, a uh, directive as to what to do. And so it was outwardly and perishable. But the life of Christ, uh, it was not outwardly, it was inherited in the individual. And it was imperishable. It was never going to, to end. In verse 17, he says, for he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And this is what they're talking about, the order of Melchizedek. Like Melchizedek, Christ had no uh, predecessor. He had no successor. He's it. Like Melchizedek, Melchizedek uh, Christ remains a priest and a king on his uh, throne perpetually. And of course, it, at the end of time, when everything is done away with, he'll deliver up the, uh, his kingdom to God, and that will be the yeah, end of everything. So the, the old law is going to be uh, uh, disannulled. And the new law, by virtue of the fact that he'll, it'll never end to the uh, end of time, it's superior to the old law. It's going to be disannulled. You might will uh, get into that in the Hebrews the seventh chapter, verses eighteen, which we'll just start. And he goes all the way to the thirteenth chapter of uh, chapter eight. So it's going to show the superiority of the new law over the old law. <clears throat> And I think you could, uh, reading this, you could see that it's coming because, you know, you, you see that uh, he, he proved that the priesthood was feared, of Christ was feared to the Levitical priesthood, so there had to be a chain of law. He says, for the, on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its sweetness and unprofitableness. Because of the weakness and imperfections of the, the flesh, the old law could perfect nothing. People could not keep the old law, and there was no provision for covering a sin like the uh, uh, you know, all the blood that was ever spilled in the under the old law. Some uh, animal sacrifices could not uh, uh, forgive one sin, could not cover one sin. It was, of course, symbolic. And if one did not obey that, of course, they would be guilty of disobedience. But that in itself uh, did not uh, wash away sin. Only the blood of Christ did that. So instead of a, just a mere change of the law, it was abrogated, just done away with. It was not, you know, amended. It was not amended. It was just completely done away with and replaced. And of course, uh, looking from my perspective, uh, we can see now that the old law was never intended to be permanent. It was always temporary. And of course, I, I'm sure that the uh, Jews over the years, uh, you know, the Jews thought that that law was going to just be forever. They're going to have a earthly king again in Jerusalem, and it's just going to continue that way forever. But it was never intended to be permanent. It's always intended to be temporary. In verse 19, it says, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Now, the reason that the law was abrogated and replaced, it could make uh, no one perfect. 
uh, it was introductory, it was temporary, it gave way to a law that had better promises. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 21, is, it says there, and of course, as Paul writing to is, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if that there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. That law couldn't give life. It said in Galatians, the second chapter, verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God for the righteousness comes through the law. And if, if the righteousness comes through the law, that's the mosaical system, then Christ died in vain. In Romans 8, chapter verses 2 through 4, it says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak to the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous, righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So there was a better hope granted to man uh, through God's pardon of grace, and that's the grace of the gospel. In Romans, the uh, fifth chapter, verses one and two, it reads there, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In verse 20 of chapter 7, it says, And inasmuch as he was not made perfect without an oath, uh, and that's the oath of God, so it's, and it is by virtue of that confirmed and guaranteed that Christ is now our high priest. You might recall that uh, the temporal priests of the Levitical uh, priesthood were not sworn in by an oath, but uh, through uh, an authentic authenticated genealogy. Jesus was made the high priest after his resurrection, but not during his earthly ministry. In the 21st uh, first verse of um, chapter 7, it says, for they have become priests without an oath. That's that's the uh, uh, ironic uh, political priesthood that was established by decree and not by an oath. In Exodus 28, verse 1, it says, now take Aaron, your brother, and his son with him from among you, talking to uh, Moses, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron, and Aaron's sons. Nadab, Abihu, and of course we know what happened to them, Eliezer and Githmar. So uh, they were not appointed by an oath. They were, you know, God told them, you're, you're going to do this. But he, that's the God the Father, with an oath by him, that's also the Father, said to him, Jesus, the Lord is sworn, that is, that's an oath, the Lord is sworn and will not relent. That's his will in the matter will never change. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now this priesthood of Christ will never change or be abolished. And the covenant on which it is based will never change or be abolished. There is no, no other covenant that will ever come after the uh, covenant under which we exist now. So therefore, there is no priesthood beyond the priesthood of Christ, uh, nor a covenant to replace the new covenant in which we serve today. Christ will continue as priest and king until the work of man's redemption is fully accomplished. And that's when the uh, church, the kingdom is delivered up to God. In the 22nd uh, verse, it's, it's, a, it's a continuation, it said by so much more Jesus has become a 
surety of a better covenant. Now, you know, when God says something, he doesn't need a, a surety or a guarantor uh, when he, uh, when there's a God-given covenant. Nevertheless, uh, he gave Christ. You know, he's dealing with man as man. We like sureties. So he, he uh, gave Christ as a surety. And the question one has to ask is, what if we reject the surety? And that's what the Hebrew Christians were uh, about to do. They're about to reject the surety. The Levitical priests received their appointment according to uh, mutable, I mean, it changed, it can change, mutable and transitory law of lineal descent. It perfected nothing since it was by design preparatory to a better covenant. It was temporary. <clears throat> the new covenant was inaugurated by Christ, of which he was made the surety. As such, this new covenant embracing the uh, priesthood of Christ and, of course, the justification and sanctification and uh, redemption of mankind, it provides to those uh, that, that it provides to those who believe and obey him. And we need to stress that, that it must be uh, believed and obeyed. He will never be abrogated. It will never be replaced until its uh, purposes in Christ have been accomplished. And that's what the writer is trying to get these Hebrew Christians to understand. <clears throat> in verse 23, also there are many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Uh, the Levitical priesthood of the old law as opposed to the high priest of Christ. Though the Levitical priest died, Christ uh, will live forever. But he, because he continues favor, has unchanged priesthood. Christ is eternal, therefore, his priesthood is eternal. And the many priests of the old law uh, change, they change. The one priest of the new law abides forever, it never changes. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to finish this chapter, so I think I'll stop here. I'll stop the recording.